Good morning. This is No Sweat on October 6, 2022. And this is the second of my Dark Side series. This will be a, uh, another video, and I won't do any more after this, but I wanted to do two of them. This will be my second Dark Side video, and this time I will be talking about another subject that's related to the first subject, and, and this will be a uh, story about Sions, uh, one of the oldest uh, strains of racing pigeons uh, that exist and probably have more history attached with them than does any other strain. Uh, my first video, dark side video, that we recorded yesterday and is now out on YouTube uh, was over three hours long. And uh, it is all about Charles Hotzman. And Charles Hotzman is the person who I got my racing pigeons from. And I keep Sions. And my Sions came from Charles Hotzman. And Charles Hotzman got his Sions from Sion himself. He got them from Paul Sion, the man who originated the strain. And he also got them from uh, his son, Robert Sion, after World War II. Uh, I think Charlie uh, uh, had seven importations. And uh, uh, four of them, I think, came from Paul. And three of them came from uh, his son after World War II. Uh, there, was a, there was a difference in the, uh, uh, the Sions and uh, from what Paul had had and from what Robert had had. I've been privy in my lifetime uh, to uh, see all the original correspondence, the actual handwritten uh, letters that Paul Sion uh, wrote to Charlie Heitzman and to also the, uh, the letters uh, that were written to uh, Charlie Heitzman from Robert Sion. Uh, and I learned a great deal about that. And I'm privy, uh, I'm one of the few people probably still alive and maybe the only person that uh, has been able to carefully multiple times stare at, look at, and study the actual photographs of the interior of of Sion's loft, both Paul's and Robert's. Uh, Robert had several lofts. Uh, Paul's main loft was a four-story loft uh, that many people have seen pictures of. And uh, I, I have been able to uh, see in great detail and learn a lot about first, almost, and second-hand knowledge of the uh, actual pure Sions that were sent over from Sions uh, to the United States. And the first Sions uh, by Paul were uh, always beautiful, many of them, but not uniform in type and in size. Uh, there were certainly some big birds there and uh, that were rangy, uh, and some of them almost a, a little bit wild uh, to birds that I uh, have carefully looked at to see that were much very small in size. So there was a was a big uh, variation in Sions. And that upsets me a lot of times because I see people that are like, that they know a Sion, you know, 20 miles away. And a real Sion man knows that that's not true. I've seen Sions that didn't look like the, the, the wedge head and the apple-bodied, showy-looking pigeons that sometimes people advertise as Sions, and they can be Sions, but that's not uh, always 100% true as to what all the Sions look like. And even when you're breeding Sions, which I've bred thousands of them in my life, um, I get a lot of variation of the babies. A lot of times you'll put two birds together and you'll think that all the babies are gonna have their similarities, uh, but they turn out uh, not to be exactly like that. There'll be Sometimes I get birds that, uh, instead of wedge-headed, are more snappy in the face, more round-headed. And I really believe that a lot of the original Sions, particularly when you look at Charles Heitzman's original Sion pair, which was two red chicks, 1104 and 1033, uh, one of them being bred down from a real famous blue bar white flight cock named Leroy, that when you do that, uh, 
you'll see that those birds were round-headed and had and weren't wedge wedged face or showy at, at all. Uh, so, and they were the original seons. So you, when you start seeing birds now that are beautiful and stuff, and that they're seons, uh, like I said, that's not that's not necessarily universal in the way that all seons uh, do look. Uh, I want to. I'll be quoting from and reading from a little bit from um, an article that I wrote uh, some time ago for the Racing Pigeon Digest uh, of the uh, I will start it off uh, exactly as uh, I had written. Uh, this dastard collection of verbiage innocently hopes to be a current overview of the once most famous and prestigious family of racing pigeons throughout all of France, as well as all of Europe. And in addition, it is also the same family of racing pigeons, which was once the most single dominant strain of racing pigeons ever to have existed throughout North America. Of delightful note, if any of my learned and worldly and superior astute attack dog reader uh, ship, uh, if this irritates you uh, or denotes something of some nature which I have written or that I say now to you to be uh, for them in some troublesome dismay, if it upsets you in some way that uh, things that I say about sins, I should like to appeal to you and humbly and sincerely beg for th that wounded hound dog's bone toothy forgiveness, me, f for me less than in for far more less than intelligent for all my transgression transgressions. It is this long awaited for and much needed story, which again the lawyer genios had asked me to create. I have attempted to chisel into so many sublime and rather ridiculous horrible rumors and slightly stimulate a wee many cocksure, stymied and feeble bird brain minds in the process of vaingloriously attempting to allow some tiny bit of nourishment for thought when for so many decades there has been only a barren table to attend to or no table to attend to at all when it comes to the subject of seons. I, ha I have been exposed to so much ignorance regarding seons that it is unbelievable. The stories that, that exist about seons make me irk. So I will continue, and I will give you a brief bow about myself. I spent my formative years Growing up smack dab inside a rather darksome, ongoing Appalachian, what you might call, cocktail party. The small apartment where I eked out a place to hide among my Hollywood handsome parents, I thought then it to be nothing short of a palace. If you were young enough and poor enough or drunk enough, it was just that. I met every politician and paltry character high of high and low order that you could dream. All the high ups wanted a secret place, secret low place to wink and have a good time. And the low downs wanted a shadowy place to dodge labor and lick their lips and on occasion possibly touch what they perceived as someone of importance. Doctors, lawyers, senators, governors, movie stars, editors, Feeble creatures of all manner and design found their way up to those 66 steps which led up to our tainted apartment to forget what was beyond those apartment doors. My dashing uncle happened to be the very best trumpet player in the entire state of Kentucky, recognized so, and he wound up on occasion, oddly enough, up in New York at the Cotton Club, there in New York just before the war, when he would in fightingly crash into our confines in that apartment with his bevy of goose-tailed allies and huckleberry honorage of painted women. The apartment transformed instantly into a glorious Lady Day and Ella Fitzgerald nightclub, possessing immense excitement of which many times lasted for days or until the libations ceased to exist. 
when I wasn't listening to all the stories from my beautiful and often tortured and the often tor- tortured individuals, I would be nestled in the middle seat of the front row of my grandfather's theater. Our bricked bulwark of an apartment was partially connected to that, and in places over top that converted livery stable. The configured front of that picture show that my grandfather had built and owned appeared akin to somewhat like the neon Alamo located on the Kentucky River. There wasn't a there wasn't a movie made that I did not absorb. Place, characters, dialogue, and musical score. Movie stars were precisely how my drunken family communicated. Our sunsets were bally high sunsets, and I was content being a greatly loved and tutored in the ways of delightful and depressing world by my Robert Mitchum father and Lauren Bacall mother. I had seons then living underneath one section of the apartment. On occasion, I could hear their French voices as the sun would begin to rise. Those were some of the best moments in my life to wake up listening to the birds inches below where I was laying, underneath of me. I have written several books now, These Precious Days, went through 800 rejections, and I was thrilled when it did find a publisher, and I like to believe that that shows that uh, I believe in what I do, I stayed with that. My second book, Nefarious, was about the first outlaw hanged in eastern Kentucky based on a true story. And it's being uh, redone uh, by another publisher. Hopefully it'll come out this year. It's going to be called uh, Red Skies, Red Whiskey, and Red-Headed Women. And then my third book that came out was Singer Island and Ernest Hemingway, Volumes 1 and 2, and Volume 3 will be coming out later on. But it goes into a great, uh, I call it my pizza pie work. It's eight different subjects that all come together in a big pie. And it's all about my life with Louisa Lang, the daughter of the famous uh, World War II correspondent for Life magazine and a close friend of Ernest Hemingway's and her suicide and uh, my relationship with John D. MacArthur, then the world's richest man in the North America, had $6 billion dollars. Uh, a good friend of mine, and and it continues to go on and about scuba diving and how I got my pigeons and everything else. It has many pictures of uh, of Charles Heitzman and uh, his pigeons as well as my seons too. Then I wrote another le- uh, uh, book called Letters from a Genius to an Oaf, and it's about my relationship, my 15 years with my literary mentor, uh, Guy Davenport, a Rhodes Scholar, a absolutely brilliant man who influenced me greatly uh, in writing. Uh, that that book is called Letters from a Genius to an Oaf. His correspondence and mine are now kept in an archives at the University of Texas. Um, and then Black Bluegrass was a collection of short stories that I've written uh, that are all true stories that I've played with just a little bit. Uh, You may enjoy that. Some of the stories take place in eastern Kentucky, and some of them take place in the Outer Islands and the Bahamas and Eleuthera. And uh, and I'm working right now on a a novel called The Boat That Never Was and several other projects. (laughs) Uh, One being an archaeological work uh, where last year I dug for 58 days uh, and uh, hope to be able to put all that information together and... Uh, hopefully it'll be one of the uh, finest books that's ever been written on a archaeological work done at a Civil War site, an American Civil War site here in the United States. For my esteemed and honorable and dedicated pigeon publishing uh, Montana Bayou lawyer editor Fran Genios and my old mentor Charles Paul Heitzman and my ancient pigeon friends John Barrymore McQuithy and Gary Wayne Stone and Jim Calhoun Isselhart and my newest unrequited friend and is named John Wesley Jennings I dedicate this uh, video and I would like to quote Voltaire as he says it is dangerous to be right in the matters on which the established authorities are wrong 
And uh, that's what you're going to be getting here when I start talking to you about seons. I'm going to run contrary to a great many things that float around out there that are not true. Mons Paul Pierre Marie Joseph Sion was born on February 4th, 1872, in the same mansion where he was able to return from exile and where he died six months later after Germany had surrendered. Paul was 74 years old. His father, Henry Charles Joseph Sion, had also been born and died in the same mansion. Henry had been 86 years of age upon his death. On March 23, 1922, Paul's mother, Celine Marie Hedden, died there as well, as did Robert Louis Sion. He lived from 1898 to 1961, and he was Paul's son and also a great pigeon flyer, who was one of Paul's he was one of Paul's uh, sons, and along with his three daughters. Uh, my, my tracing Paul Sion's ancestry, the chart shows it is a family of solid French nobility, dating back well into the mid-1700s. Heaven help how many times I've listened to so many confused fanciers pronounce the word Sion. In some unadulterated and strange way, so often I hear scion, I rarely correct anyone spouting the word as such as it can lead to an immediate and somewhat despicable dismay between the two of us. There have been a few exotic voices even pronounce it shyan. For me, and the way that Mr. Charles Heisman pronounced the word, it is scion. Like S E E O N N, Sion. Understand once you see correctly what the greatest family of racing pigeons happen to be, then you are right on. So it's Sion. Sion. Thus the glorious combined word Sion. If you aren't a pigeon holic, if you're not a pigeon holic, the flamboyant but simple word Sion usually refers to the Bible, the name of a stronghold which was captured by David, the second king of the Israelite. Above it was built a temple, and later the name extended to the whole hill. Finally, it became a synonym for the city of Jerusalem. The inhabitants of Jerusalem are personified as the daughters of Zion. The Templar Order of Knights Temper was created, protected Christian pilgrims as they journeyed to Jerusalem. This being an effective order for the secretive order, the priority, the priority of Sion, their true mission in Jerusalem. The priority of Sion was a secret organization with roots older than the Knights Templar. Some of the grand masters of the pri priori priority of Sion, priority of Sion have been Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Victor Hugo, and Jean Cocteau. Jean Cocteau. The word Sion can also mean an imaginary place. Sion is also a Welsh name of Hebrew origin, meaning God is gracious. Paul Sion, our pigeon man who I'm talking about, happened to be a filthy rich fancier who lived in Tourcoing, France before World War II. Together with Rabol, its neighboring city, Tourcoing became a major center for wool textiles. Sheep were grazed there along the hillsides along there long before the Romans, and it was from their sheep, from the sheep and their wool which Paul Theon earned just one of his fortunes. He became one of those people in Europe, particularly in France, known as the wool kings of France. Lots of stories have been told about Paul Theon and his son, Robert. I once created a fictional story wherein Paul and his son hid their beautiful pigeons in a Lascaux cave in World War II to keep the Germans from finding them. In this story, which was printed in several magazines, including the Racing Pigeon Digest, I created a squad of Germans led by Sergeant Isselhart which discovered the cave, and just as they grew close to the pigeons, 
Paul and Robert Sion opened up on them with rapid machine guns, killing the entire patrol. Poor Isselhart was shot horribly to pieces. What was rather remarkable in that, as the years went by, I began to hear from different stalwart fanciers, sure in everything they said, all about Paul and Robert Sion, how they had hidden their birds in a cave throughout World War II. Quite factual, you know. They were so sure of themselves. And the moon is made of green cheese, I thought. Sometimes I wanted to stop and inform these poor, self-sure wretches, these smart pigeon fanciers, bellowing their factual story that it was merely a fabulous tale which I'd enjoyed creating. But I resisted the temptations. I just sat back and listened and sometimes smiled. I once had two fanciers who didn't know me from a boiled turnip tell me in confidence of all about Charles Heitzman, how that man had earned his money with his seons. According to their dogmatic knowledge, Heitzman had bought a penthouse down there in Rich Palm Beach, had them seons down there doing nothing, to do nothing but slick back, they were all slick back velvets owning brilliant pearl eyes. And once a week, according to these hillbillies, once a week, these 200 black velvet seons of hisn would fly across the Gulf Stream from somewhere over there in the Bahamas to his penthouse, which was in part hidden, a uh, part hidden loft, uh, an ivory tower that he would light up at nights as if some air traffic control center, each bird carrying two ounces of cocaine, 200 times two ounces once a week, clockwork. The birds couldn't be seen they couldn't be seen flying at night them being black and all feathered drones is what they were it too was another figment of one of my created yarns and again i sat back and smiled listening to them tell my story that i'd created as though it were facts i love listening to the that chronicle told by those two brilliant fanciers who would have slapped my face if I had interrupted, it reminded me quite well of a soldier named Sam in World War II movie called The Big Red One, which starred Lee Marvin. And there's one scene as the soldiers are taking a break from the action. Sam is smoking a cigar and sees a recruit intently reading a book called The Dark Deadline. Sam gets almost up into his face of that soldier reading the book the whole time, blowing cigar smoke across the book and into that recruit's face, eyes. How do you like the book, he asks. The recruit answers, damn good. Sam smiles, takes a drink, and hands the bottle to the new recruit. I'm Sam. Welcome. Nice to meet you. That's my book. Your book? I got this from the Repro Depot in San Lo. I wrote it, babyface, and I printed it. So there's nothing quite as delicious for as, uh, to be an author and see somebody reading your work and, and them not know who you are and them like it uh, is where I'm going with that. <clears throat> of course, if you truly knew anything about Paul or Robert Sion, you would have known that they did not have any birds during World War II. And if they had, they sure as hell would never have hid them in any cave. The odds that either Paul or Robert ever getting their shoes or their fingernails a bit cave dirty was far beyond them. They were filthy rich people, and dirt was not a, an item that ever interfered in their lives. Better odds than on any of the nags that I've ever wagered on if you thought that that happened. Paul Sion was also known as the Cotton Baron of France. It was common to see him inside the loft elegantly suited in a sporty herringbone court coat and matching six-button vest wearing a Homburg hat, a French script necktie done in classic triangular symmetrical knot standing out perfectly from his blinding white dress shirt with its small spear point collars folded just so, and covering his plaid silk socks would be his classic toe cap oxfords he was quite the gentleman's gardener <clears throat> if a speck of defiant dirt ever somehow managed to find refuge under one of his fingernails it came from one of the manicured roses he enjoyed cultivating and nothing else and whatever interested paul Theon, 
He was the man who had to have the very finest of whatever it was, no matter what it was, if it was a shotgun or a hunting dog or a rose or a thoroughbred or a pigeon. And certainly he loved his famed fighting cocks. What pigeon man worth his salt hasn't seen a game rooster in his loft? On September 3, 1939, France declared war on Germany following the invasion of its ally, Poland. In early September 1939, when that happened, the fat hit of the fire, the fat hit the fire for Paul Sion and his world-renowned family of racing pigeons. On June 22nd, the second armistice of Copain was signed by Copain was signed by France and Germany. The neutral Vichy government, led by Marshal Philip Pétain, Pétain, allowed Germany to occupy the north and west coast of France. Tourcoing is in the northern France along the Belgian border, and it was here that general headquarters of the German 15th Army Group based itself. For Paul Sion, it was all a nightmare. He had to escape before it became reality. The Germans had issued a proclamation stating if they found anyone with homing pigeons, that person would be shot as a spy. Paul's pigeons were just one matter. He also had his thoroughbreds, his hunting dogs, and even some of the best fighting chickens in all of France, which, as he could see, would make excellent soup for the German soldiers. All the critters had to be relocated. He gave his world prize pigeons to the French underground, who were small groups of anti-German, Steingun, etc., armed men and women called them the Marquis, hiding out in the rural areas of France. One of the more beautiful World War II pens ever designed is the very rare World War II Free French Army Resistant Military Badge, the Charles Cross of Lorraine. The badge is that of a homing pigeon carrying the cross of Lorraine. And yes, not only did the French resistance have Sions directly from Paul Sion, but also from many other Sion breeders from all over the United States who got paid uh, so much per bird, $5 I believe, to donate their Sions to the armed services during that time. My mentor, Charles Heitzman, being just one of those persons and probably the main Sion supplier for World War II. Heitzman's Sions flew in different areas throughout Europe and Asia during World War II. A few Chinese fanciers to this day have direct Sions supposedly leading back to his World War II Sions, many of them being light red checks. Today, when the antique beat-up word Sion is still mentioned in pigeon circles, this may come as a wounded knee shark attack Hiroshima surprise, but there just so happens to be a few of the old original Sions still alive to this very day in America and all throughout the world, America having the best of them, as even said by the French. Canada and Australia and Belgium and as Patrick Giles, such as Patrick Gills, to name a few. Uh, and I'm really not sure about the... Uh, the Sions in Australia, even though there are a few people that claim they have them, that got them from one of my friends. Uh, I'll go into that later. These pigeons are so pure that they coo parlez vue. I am certainly unable to authoritatively and singly sling out for all the past and remaining Sion breeders of today to sing out for them. I would feel most sorry for anyone who would challenge such and not believe that they would surely, that they would be surely jumping on many tender toes. The voice of Oz, Walter Cronkite of Sion's per se, could easily sink their own battleship, and certainly in any attempt to discuss Sion's. I can get into the boiling hot water with just as many non-Sion breeders as Sion breeders themselves in taking on an article such as this, talking about nothing but Sion's. I plainly know that. And as I highly respect all those Sion breeders of which I do not know, of which are numerous, the same can easily go for me as in such and all this. It's a mad, mad world 
gillions of modern day get rich quick fanciers who believe in crossing pigeons and supposedly enriching genes and producing as they do hybrids. I am not in this soup. I am not in reinventing myself constantly and marketing pigeons and selling pigeons as these people do. I am not in this soup kettle. Many of today's most esteemed fanciers enjoying boasting and going on about hybrids. Uh, None of them stopping to really smell the roses and think about what's going really on around them. Which to them and for them is like saying they have added genetic gasoline to a smoldering fire. I suppose at best I am somewhat of a self-imposed lost 911 Sion flagship. Vito Sion Corleone, hillbilly in a Kentucky hollow, gazing steadfastly at a tattered barn bored chicken coop to which I Fetch Creek polluted creek water, a whole corn base for a devoted brotherhood of senior fanciers who still have Sion's, truly pure old Sion's, as if Paul Sion had bred them himself. Some of the birds could easily adorn Paul Sion's handlebarred mustache. Just last week, I observed a bona fide Sion getting out of a Citron DS-19 wearing a French Foreign Legion kepi performing the can-can while singing Les Marelles, Les Marcel and picking on a French green bean. She winked at me, informing her name was Michelle. I'll be your belle, she said, effect- effectively shy. And for of these esteemed and venerable Sion gentlemen... Rarely, if ever, will they consider departing with any of their beloved birds. Their seons represent the past, something they have to hold on to. And when you get old, the past is all you have, that and privileging. Their seons are not kept for racing. Quite often, their lofts are on the order of Fort Knox. They keep these birds for other things. And there are the other Sion fanciers beyond them. They fly their birds for the momentary enjoyment, owning all the trivialities of hoping to be average. At sweet time, sitting down and living off colorful pedigrees. Oh, the pedigrees. Everybody wants a good pedigree. They advertise their birds for sale. Genuine Sions with pedigrees, signed by Charles de Gaulle. Neon pedigrees, blinding all logic Blinding, blinding all logic and attracting green as grass money. They know little to almost nothing about the real Sions, and each passing day they grow even worse with their knowledge. Some of them even quote my fictional stories as having actually occurred. I don't much blame them, as so often a wonderful fairy tale is far more interesting than the simple truth. That doesn't matter. They count the hurry, 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 step right up here, money, and smile. They are content creatures, ready to watch the Waltons, and happy as hell just to say that they have a Sion, a glorious Sion. I've got Sions, and as wonderfully sublime as all that may be, it's nothing short of And in this tent, you will see the man on the flying trapeze. And if you look close, you will see a magnificent Theon roosting atop his Victor Mature curly locks. That is, if Delilah hasn't found those scissors. Last, there remains fanciers who are serious about winning with Theons. They don't cater to the constant uh, eruption of want-to-be domineering expert voices lecturing about hybrids or crossings, those people all secretly gathering money uh, in various manners, uh, playing their games as they do. They have been around since, the, these guys have been around since Noah got the Sion back with that enormous limb in his mouth. They know all about the crossing up stuff. Hooray for an ark full of geniuses. Gregory Mendel's peas and the rose is a rose is a rose, which can be yellow, pink, white, or even green. After all, the crossings are often from families themselves. They forget that. Some families are genetically simple and some not so. Even the men who developed families started someplace, and some of those men have brought in crosses to their families more than others. Still, with all that said, they basically remain devoted to their distinct family of pigeons. They are... 
old school. They have been on a rowdy H rawhide genetic roundup and have herded their little doggy feathered genes to corral some corrals being bigger than others. They are in a holding pattern and smile at hecklers. Among them are different philosophies. Most cling to originality. They manipulate a spider web of concentrated genetics. There are a few of these purists attempting to harness the essence of Sions while at the same time moving them into the future of pigeon racing. I, no sweat, happen to be that person and one of them. I am not sure how the rumors began, but over the past 30 years, while so many different illustrious imports skidded into the runways and convoys of Lockheed C-5 galaxies into America, I observed quietly agog with my glass phone booth in, that all of it somehow reminded me of the seagulls in Alfred Hitchcock's movie. And at the same time, I began to hear the that the Sions were an old strain of race and pigeons, worthless, akin to the dinosaurs. And on that note, all birds are. You know, if you do know anything about evolution or genetics, you do know that the birds are akin to dinosaurs. All of them. In fact, the birds are the remnants of dinosaurs, if you really want to get into it and really want to know about birds and where they went and what happened to them and where they came from. And same thing about the dinosaurs and so forth. But non such is are we humans? Homo sapiens. Wink, wink. Such stuff was but one of the reasons that Sions began to disappear. If folk repeat something, as politicians well know, long enough it becomes a fact whether it's true or not. Political campaign managers know this. Stuff by the heartbeat. And when something gains financial rewards from such trash talk, it becomes the Niagara Falls of dulcet distortion. What was slowly taking place was a kind of perfect pigeon storm for the innocent Sions. Little by little, New fanciers chose not to invest in them, and the few that did found that they were no better or not as good as the other pigeons they had. National logic dictated the Sions had run their route and had gone, their pa gone to pasture. The important questions were never being asked, and still they're not. Um, and today, when a Sion breeder such as myself which is devoted to maintaining and once again bringing Sions back into the limelight and into focus for the world to actually recognize and see their beauty and, and, and what fantastic birds they are, such as racing them in America's biggest race, the Hoosier Classic, and in the world's definitive best recognized toughest pigeon race right now currently in the world, then the South America, uh, African Million Dollar Race, what I wind up facing is, let's see, duh, I have these Sions here. Just exactly how many other true Sions are in these other races? In these other races? How many Sions do you really see? True Sions in the big races? I should take a conservative guess and say that the actual ratio is along the order of some 500 pigeons to my one Sion if I enter these big races. And I don't believe anyone quite understands or comprehends or expounds on that information. Hell no. They don't want anybody to know the facts or, or to stop and think about anything. I don't believe that the pigeon world can fathom what might happen if I were to supply just 50% of the entries in either of those two races with Sions, my pure Sions, or any pure Sions, or no, let's just say my Sions, because they are different. These are racers. Then what might be the results if that happened? I finished 41st and 88th in South Africa in 2019 with my Sions. I led the entire United States in the grand average speed for several races on those tosses. And in 2020, I was 91st on a, with another pure Sion of mine in the Hoosier Classic. I was 16th in the Hoosier Classic on their tough 150-mile uh, race that they had, which caused something of an uproar 
for several fanciers due to the losses on that race, a, a, a smash. These were all pure Sions, and all of this recently having happened. Yes, those same birds, everyone in America were whispering, were long gone. Maybe my few entries in these two races were not the only Sions in those races. I certainly cannot say for certain. But if not, they certainly ranked right there with a very scant handful. These are the same Sions which set world long distance record flying over the water several years ago. And again, they were Sions which came from Charles Heitzman, who constantly advertised, the best come from the best. The best come from the best. The apple does not fall far from the tree. These are the Sions which for the past 10 straight years, as I have always flown at least 500 mile young birds, Four times they have gone 700 miles as young birds. Each of these times that happened to be the single longest young bird tosses in the entire world. And these releases can easily be viewed, if you have any doubts, on YouTube. 700 mile young bird release, no sweat is all you have to type in. 700 miles young bird release, no sweat. Two times in the past 10 years, uh, Two times in the last 10 years, I have released young birds from 600 miles, always getting returns on the second day. Twice, I have had 500-mile day young birds. And on 700 miles, my best was three years ago when I had four hens come back on the third day. Yes, see on young birds. These 700-mile young bird releases are the longest releases for young birds in the entire world. I would guess that not one in a thousand racing pigeons reared in the United States, no matter who has them or what their pedigrees are or who, what kind of eye signs they have, could begin to fly back from 700 miles as a young bird. And I mean ever come back, period. Why would anyone demand this of his Sions? Certainly it is not like everyone else if you happen to follow what everyone else does and then expect to be better. Then think again. What what I do is to be different, to follow everybody else, and then to think that you're going to be better than everybody else is uh, poor thinking. Uh, what I do in all this is to attempt to home in, to hone in, what I believe are the two most important components comprising of great racing pigeons. Clearly bring out those genes within the family of Sions, the homing instinct and intelligence. If you manage to get a young bird back from 700 miles, you will appreciate that pigeon more than any 300 mile young bird. As my old swim coach always said, Don Combs, talk is cheap. Once you are able to systematically place your thumb down on which of your birds truly possess a superior homing instinct and a superior intelligence, which go hand to hand often, those things which you cannot see, nobody can tell you that a bird has a homing instinct or intelligence just in a, in a show cage, then any paltry fool should be able to breed the kind of elite body and all else which is relevant for racing. Some fire-breathing experts proclaim Sions don't even exist, a surely went extinct with their cousin, the dodo bird. One matter is clear, those experts are in no way becoming those experts are in no way becoming extinct themselves. I see them as pride and ignorance holding hands in ten generation pedigrees, line bred, inbred, crossbred, you name it. Laughable uh, ruthless rumor smothers the polluted air that encompasses the world of Sions. We're slow and could begin to compete against the new European speed demons now being advertised. Oh yes, the Sions are slow. I won't mention the fact that uh, in the last five years I've had birds flying over 2,000 yards per minute in different races. Uh, at one point, 2,300 yards a minute. Uh, and what about all these famous pigeons that are in the greatest races? Uh, 
that are flying on the average of, you know, 1,200, 1,300 yards a minute. Does anybody ever stop to go back and look to see what the uh, flying records, the speed records are of, of pigeons? Uh, I don't. I think not. I think just talk, talk, talk's what gets it. Laughable, ruthless rumor mongers smothers that polluted air when it comes to sea ions. Sold is the key word here. Now we are continuously and systematically and dogmatically somewhat forced to buy into a goose step adherence with pigeons. We have methodically been brainwashed with the new and stoic belief that ever so suddenly somehow the Europeans have created these conditions of feathered phantom jets capable of flying so fast that they can disappear out of sight and return from another galaxy with a message from Zeus. Perfectly photoshopped jets, always for sale at prices where you can mortgage your home and give up your firstborn. One might teasingly hope for one pathetic second that our poor sport would pursue for one second and give serious thought to all this crap instead of reaching for their checkbook. One would set forth a small pillow and then kneel and pray that for one gillionth of one second that our easily mind-boggled, manipulated sport would not believe just every ruby-throated, advertised pile of words and beautiful pictures of a pigeon standing in attention as they were hooked to an electric outlet happens to dance along. I would have hoped that the old T-Rexes, along with the wide-eyed neophytes in our sport, would have fallen back on a slight bit of wee little research and possibly do some fact-checking regarding speeds. But then I suppose such ancient stuff would take time in today's advanced and time-consuming, busy, busy schedule, and on top of such, most fanciers wouldn't know where to begin. Common sense might have substituted, but there is a dire shortage of that primordial substance. These so-called miraculous triple X light speed cat gut slick as slime push button speedsters to me are little more than shiny souped up front row vehicles weighed in on a Rolls Royce dealership carrying eye bulging price tags and for God's sake, please do not look under the hood. These most magnificent racing specimens that keep being imported in and all these fanciers always reinventing themselves coming and going as newfangled bluebell genetic playmates of the month are just that word was back when John Wayne was actual person who shot Liberty Valance, that Sion's had been a durable cuss. But when Dennis Weaver came on Gunsmoke, all that went awry. As I imagined upon hearing all of this fried Sion bo baloney, Messerschmitt, BF-109, wounded World War II, B-17s crashing to the cliffs of Dover, their hollow bones bleaching in the sun. That's the story so many puff. The magic dragon and brain-dead experts push and demand that you instantly purchase their uh, self-published copy fresh of their presto position next to your Bible. And yes, buy that pigeon from them. Amen. Their hybrid gods. The rumor millers hawking and perniciously gliding at COVID-19 fever pitch, quite ignorant about what they have happily heard and the perpetuated claim that, that any and all manner of negative innuendo regarding Sion's. Now it appears a Sion somehow shot Abraham Lincoln. According, if you have a Sion, you need your head examined. With a 16-ton ball-peen hammer, uh, and are at the very least to be pitied, placed in isolation on Napoleon's Mount Elba, on or in seclusion, as in Judah's Ben Hur's entire family inside Antonia Fortress, and later to be leprosy, be placed in a leprosy colony. These get rich quick flannel mouths, uh, passing all this hot air off about, negatively about Sion's and, and how wonderful their hybrids are are the very yahoos who have brought in on the, have bought in on the idea that the new strains they have hocked their homes to acquire 
are somehow superior pigeons. Nothing could be further from the truth. Combinations of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Dwayne Johnson, Bruce Lee, and Sylvester Stallone, and Steve Reeves, and a dash of Van Diesel. That's what these birds, they, they advertise. And on race days, these newfound magnificent creatures go into a phone booth and change their feathers and come out with a big S on their chest, leaping tall buildings in one bound, faster than a speedy bullet, and all of them can sing and dance and play a piano at the same time. Some can fly to the moon and back and blink an eye and hand you a block of green cheese. Captain Kirk had nothing on them. When Picard says engage, there is no telling how far these new racing pigeons coming over from Europe will go. Those were the bold facts, per se, and so many people want to believe, and it's hard to stop people from wanting to believe. It was gloriously and steadfastly explained throughout the pigeon galaxies that you must cross birds in order to get the best. When I heard this, I thought of the Three Stooges movie I had recently enjoyed wherein the Three Stooges had rented out a drugstore. Business was desultory. And their loaded, and their landlord came in for his rent. He soon left, warning that he would return the next morning, and they better have their due rent. The Stooges came up with the brilliant idea to create a pill which would make everyone young again. They began experimenting with all manner of drugs, crossing poltoons, mixing elixirs, pouring in drinks, and for good measure, adding a Mexican jumping bean. When the landlord arrived the next morning. He overdosed on the crossed-up solution and began to jump and jerk and soon became young and was soon to be in his diapers and crying. It reminded me of some romantic daydreaming Walter Mitty Fancier who buys what is supposed to be long-distance blood and then crosses it with short-distance blood and mathematically figures that these babies that derive from this cross will like be like baby bear soup, just right. You could take any pigeon and add it to what you have, shut your eyes, click your heels, and your ruby red slippers, and so forth, and voila, and there would stand the mighty champion, as if you were some dope fiend who had discovered and injected a new heroin for a quick fix. Pigeon experts will stare at you in the dead in the eye and never once blinking and give you an exact definition of what a seon is what it can do, and what it happens if a seon sees its shadow. They know everything, according to them, and I happen to know the rest. They will tell you that a seon is exactly this or exactly that and all kinds of authoritative down-the-road stuff. And if you are gullible enough and plain lame in the head enough, you may wind up believing they're in Perious manifesto and began preaching it to yourself. That's how the virus is spread. You know, it just so happens that the Sions ain't none of what they are supposed to be, according to these people that are trying to sell other birds, except for being a poor pigeon. In the past two years, I have had five different occasions where my Sions were clocked on official races at well over 2,000 yards per minute. That being just one example. I have seen Sions the size of a sparrow and the size of a damn eagle, almost. I had one fancier in Georgia plainly tell me that there are no real Sions which have any white feathers. There is no thing as a pure Sion that has, white, has any white flights or is splashed, he told me. My response was slow in coming. As I had been driving a very long time, when I met the man, I was hungry and I badly needed a beer, colder than a mother-in-law's love, and I was very tired. Where can we get a cold beer, I asked, and of course he didn't drink. Anyone considering a beer would zoom straight into hell, according to him. If only it were all so simple. The pigeon masters today have a secret genetic cocktail for brewing the finest pigeons, and this is what you must do. You must find a toad and put it in a boiling kettle, a fillet of feeny snake, the eye of a newt, the toe of a frog, the wool of bat, the tongue of a dog, adder's fork, blind worm's sting, the leg of a lizard, the scale of a dragon, the tooth of a wolf, a witch's mummy, salt sea shark, root of hemlock, and a slim of yew. 
Any of these ingredients can be substituted with the latest great imports if you can easily pronounce their names, and then they are next to worthless. I sat around wide-eyed and bushy-tailed with my thumb in my mouth watching the big circus come to town, Opie deriving, uh, Opie observing Barney teaching self-defense lessons. I had the straight, I had the strangest thought. All these deep pocket fanciers zooming in from all over the world and finding some poor old feller who has devoted his life to veiling a family of pigeons. These jet setter uh, entrepreneurs traversing traversing the globe, making him offers he can't refuse unless he was partial to a pigeon head laying next to him the next morning. Soon the old feller is sitting brain sitting string bean dried up Jeter Lester in John Ford's Eris, Nall, Eris Caldwell's Tobacco Road History. Then the pigeon mogul's brainchild. If they take his family and now them with his family of another old geezer, then the Red Sea will open up and Charlton Heston will appear flaunting his snake-changing 20-foot shaft in the Ten Commandments. The perfect pigeon cocktail is made with attention to detail, a reliable recipe, high-quality ingredients and mixing in techniques are essential to creating a well-crafted pigeon. It can be overwhelming for some fanciers to walk into a loft stocked with pigeons with foreign-sounding names with ingredients like angusta and vermouth. Every bartender would be breeder has his own style of recipes for his classic pigeons. The craft of creating a family of pigeons involves mating pigeons repeatedly and slightly each time finding fine-tuning and adjusting to make a family perfect and consistent group of pigeons on which you can rely over a course of many years. Ah, did someone say the word seons? Give me seons straight up. Make that a double. I experimented with some of these Geritol Wonder Bread snake oil wrap drive, uh, drive European superstars. None of them went into warp drive. None of them spit out silver dollars. None told me which card I was going to pull out of the deck. I couldn't even find out who was going to win the Kentucky Derby. So like all of those other ancient seeners, a tail feather few, I stuck with what I knew was true. For some 40 years, the Seons today dominated, for some 40 years, the Seons totally dominated North America, unlike any family of pigeons, north and south, east and west, all distances, climbs, and speeds. They were not playmates of the month. They were the forever Bridget Bardot's, along with Thank Heaven for Little Girls, as in Maurice Chevalier. In all these Sion lofts, you see so many variant of Sions. That stuff about once you see a Sion, you can spot a Sion 12 live years away is a bunch of malarkey. And yet, in some instances, true. So much depends. I visited one loft in Georgia and went to a college professor who was very successful with his Sions. They were not like any Sions I'd ever seen before. Light eyes, dull colors, and wild. There was this look of garbage about them. Wild. And yet I could see past all that and sense that they were Sions and of a great quality. They were winning for him out of turn and totally dominating the, the long distance races. Straight pure Sions bred only performance, bred only for the performance. I visited another loft in St. Louis. This quiet proprietor had detailed pedigrees on each of them. Oh, they were nothing but like the Dead Sea Scrolls. The birds had not flown in years, not since Adam had chomped down on that apple. Gorgeous brick reds, black velvets, and blue bars. They were butterballs, tame, heart-rendering. Each stamp had a big Sion on across its face. Sion gargoyles with barely their blood in uh, New Jersey. Each stamp... See, there were Sion gargoyles worth, worth barely, bar, barely their blood in New Jersey. 
The knowledge of d devoted gentlemen had seons which had not seen another bird in 1950. Red checks, blue checks, blue bars, classic seon, harmonious wedge face, and those dark eyes, apple body, black eyes, violet, blue, brown, green, or maroon. In California, the pro football player I party hardied with had rangy silvers and blues and black checks. Half half had a, of his birds had that seon face. They had dominated distance, but were now all on R and R. He hadn't flown them forever. They were retired, still owning the racing edge, though some, but also on the edgy on the edge of losing that edge. A fortune had been spent collecting them straight from France. His professional football money. On down the road, another Sion left them primarily for beauty. Sion innocence, I should say, derived from great racers, and in fact, is honestly a true and great Sion breeder in every way. I must salute him in Texas. Aloft uh, was nothing but silvers and red checks covered in black flecking and black splashing, some almost a black grizzling. They were Sion's, all right but hadn't flown since Noah hit dry land. For 10 grand, I could have bought 20 of them. And in the same state, another Sion law founded on two dull silvers, which look no more like Sion's than I do, than do Robert Redford, I, than I do Robert Redford. I can go on and on. New York, Florida, Washington State, the Sion's are still around. Canada, and as well as in many European lofts. One in Belgium, which has Sion, which has Sion's nearly identical to what I now have and what I race. I have noted most of today's United States Sions are genetic, are generally located in the Northeast and out West, and I am knowledgeable of a great flyer who lives in Maryland who is very successful with his Sions, and also another good fancier in Southern Florida who has long been true to racing Sions in good competition. And there are at least 20 other elderly gentlemen in Ohio Two other elderly gentlemen in Ohio who have nothing but straight Sions in their lofts and who would not sell or trade them even if the world was coming to an end. When Dr. W. Anderson in Scotland visited Paul Sion's loft in 1929, he stated, I visited the world famous fancier for the first time in 1929, and I was particularly impressed by his marvelous collection of pigeons. I must first give the slight impression of his magnificent loft installation. The building was four stories. The ground floor housed his cars. The second floor, his feed, his grain, and baskets, and odd and ends for the loft equipment. The third floor was for the old birds. It was an old bird loft for widowhoods and natural racing both. And on his fourth floor was his young birds. Monsignor was a keen gardener and was mostly interested, keenly interested in roses and sweet peas, and his other interests included gamecocks of a rather heavy type and his sporting dogs, especially setters, and, and shooting the Sion pigeons, and, and shooting, and by, by that he means he liked to trap shoot. <clears throat> These, and, and he had some of the finest shotguns that were made at that time. These Sion pigeons are essentially a hardier type of peons pigeons than are the stassards. And they stand up to uh, feeding their youngsters even as prisoners. Uh, they shine in difficult uh, headwinds and are courageous and reliable. They are also, as Dr. Bricot and Monstia proved, a very reliable cross for their particular uh, strains as well, almost with any strain, in fact, it seems. In 1946, after the war, and as Monsion request, I sent him two pairs of my best Sion blood to help establish his blood again. A few notes with reference to the origin of the Sion pigeons and regarding Mons Paul Sion's methods should be of interest. The birds go back to Mons Grizz Dungal's champion, the Mealy Cock, which won consecutively for ten successive years in the long races. The Cock was one of the strain of Mons Keekins of Antrop a family as well known at that time as the Weggies of Kassir. The cock was mated to a mealy hen of the red 
the Kimin blood, or Wege blood also, and produced a blue bar hen with black eyes, which proved to be a champion in all the races. She was later mated to a cock of the blood of the Pien and Delta Hauer. From the mating came from the famous champion, the Rouge Sion, which was also a great winner and breeder of winners. Many of the later were mealies, which were strongly black-ticked, like the original old Donegal cock. Their grandfather, Monsillon, cultivated and conserved his family for 30 to 40 years. The birds became his famous, the Vich Gris, they were the silvers. His uh, successes were phenomenal at all distances, and especially when conditions were adverse. The birds were always game and always dependable. I was forever impressed, as in my numerous visits to Monsillon's loft, there was always a certain uniform quality of birds in his loft. Even though they did range in sizes, the quality was there nonetheless. He had always a preponderance of reds and red checks and mealies. Reds and silvers seemed to be his strengths. And at all of these were of the same type. He always had a magnificent young bird team. He never seemed to have a bad breeding season. Some of his birds were above medium in size large, but all without exception were robust and muscular. Monsillon was a champion racer and outstanding breeder. Upon being allowed to handle and inspect the birds, I was always impressed by the fact, although the bird looked more than medium size, he was seldom heavy and appeared smaller in the hand. Monsillon was also a generous feeder and in his dietary used beans and veggies very largely. He always did exceptionally well with hens, and in his training of his youngsters, he was an ex exacting taskmaster. They were thoroughly selected for physical fitness before subjected to training, and all came under the, st the starter's orders. In ending this story, I should like to present a never-before-published 1959 letter written by Mons Robert Sion to Charles Heitzman. I hope that you might find it of interest. Suffice to say, I am old school Sion breeder, and I will remain forever so. I hope that someone beyond my grave is capable of taking up the torch and keeping the remarkable family of racing pigeons alive. They own such a wonderful history, so originally akin to the very roots of our sport itself, and such beautiful racers they are. Very few of the old original families of racing pigeons that ever existed remain so today as if the as these do, and it is quite understandable as to why so many of the fanciers who contact me are so often senior citizens. I suppose, in a hold on to the past way, they are all wanting once more to get on their bike and play, basket, play baseball like when they were young. And yet there are those that understand the incredible genetic qualities that these birds possess and, and continue to pass on and aspire to see them win at every, at every level of competition. Uh, the letter, again, this is all about uh, Robert uh, Sion writing to talk about uh, him going back at the end of World War II and going back to collect pigeons from the French underground uh, and, and uh, start the Sions back up again. He got the Sion, you know, they had to give them back to the French underground, and then they, at the end of World War II, they went back and got them, and that's pretty much what the letter talks about. Um, I hope you've liked this uh, discussion about Sion.